In this video, I'd like to do a book review of the book Cascadia Fallen, Tahoma's Hammer, written by Austin Chambers. This is a storyline that takes place in Western Washington, and it involves several different preppers that are involved in a grid down type situation that happens because of a major earthquake, or the big one, that's based on the Cascadia subduction zone. So there's a fault line right outside of Seattle, a large fault line, and if that thing were ever to slip, it would cause a major earthquake in addition to tsunami, and that's what happens in this storyline in addition to Mount Rainier erupting. So the Native American term for Mount Rainier is Tahoma. So Tahoma's hammer is basically the Mount Rainier eruption. So for this book review, we're going to go into a lot of details on it. There will be spoilers, so spoiler warning. I have a lot of notes over here with regard to the book. We're going to talk a little bit about the plot, about a lot of the things that I liked with regard to this book. There's a lot of prepper elements that I think would be interesting to you, the viewers, and we'll talk about some of the character storylines and then also the next steps for this book series. It's part of a three-part book series. This is book one. So let's get started now with this review of Cascadia Fallen, Tahoma's Hammer. So this is actually the first book written by author Austin Chambers, who I met earlier this summer. He mentioned that he learned how to write a book from the University of YouTube. So looking at a lot of different YouTube articles and various channels, which he describes in the first part of this book. So I thought to get started with this video, I was just gonna read the back of the book to give you a general synopsis of what the storyline is. And then I'm just gonna be talking over my notes that I have written down. So let's get started with that now. So let me read what's on the back of the book. So Tahoma, the native tribal name for Mount Rainier, wakes up after a devastating 9.0 earthquake shatters the Pacific Northwest. Entire counties are covered in mud, rock, and earth. Landslides and tsunamis add to the annihilation. Power and internet are knocked out for the entire American West. Hundreds of thousands die in the first day of the new world. Slaughter County Shooting Range Manager Phil Walker knows things will never be the same. The former Marine is no stranger to tragedy, having lost his wife to cancer and his leg to a firefight. Phil establishes a secure camp for his family and friends. Meanwhile, Phil's son Crane and Captain Marie Darnell fight to stop disaster at a nearby shipyard. The catastrophe has unleashed a nuclear nightmare inside a submarine and threatened to sink an aircraft carrier permanently. Is it too late as the worst of humanity surfaces in a rabid, deteriorating world? Will American spirit be enough as Phil and his community reel from new and dangerous threats? Let's get started with a quick rundown of the plot of Cascadia Fallen to Homa's Hammer. Again, I'm going to be looking at my notes on this one. So this story starts off with a shootout, which I wasn't really expecting. I was kind of thinking it was going to, it was going to start out something more along the lines of the movie Dante's Peak, where you start seeing some early tremors to foreshadow the impending doom of the large earthquake or volcanic eruption. This story does not do that at all. It starts out with a shootout to kind of introduce a lot of the main characters. So it's basically an introduction to the characters. And then after that is when you get the first earthquake and after that first quake earthquake happens you start seeing how these characters are responding to that situation uh, back in the early 2000s there was an earthquake that happened in washington state in western washington which uh, i experienced and the, the some of the plots that were described here kind of mimic what was seen during that earthquake after that one, the big one happens, and that's the Cascadia subduction zone that would be the large earthquake, the 9.0 earthquake. And followed by that, then you have the Mount Rainier eruption and then multiple aftershocks. And then by that point, you know, everything really goes to goes bad for Western Washington and beyond. So it basically brings down the whole American grid because, you know, there's a lot of high-tech companies that are up here. There's a lot of uh, power that's uh, being consumed, not only by the state of Washington, but by other states. And it really just starts starts a chain reaction that negatively affects basically uh, the United States from the west of the Mississippi almost. So let's see. Some of the notes that I have here is that bartering really begins early in this storyline where the various characters and the people that are involved in this emergency situation start bartering for supplies. Uh, I wrote uh, scumbags running wild. So a lot of bad guys and scumbags are basically start running wild because it becomes a lawless uh, without rule of law. So uh, and the prepared people start acting very fast in this one. This is basically the story of Phil. Phil's the main character that's involved in the shootout in the beginning of the story. And I kind of feel that he's probably based loosely on the author Austin Chambers, but more of like a, a the hero type role that you would see for many different storylines. So again, it's 
uh, the story of Phil and a lot of the surround the characters that are involved in Phil's life. So basically, in this book, there's a there's a Seattle subplot. And there's a Navy subplot, and then there's a subplot that happens at, in Slaughter County, which is AKA Kitsap County. So Slaughter County was the original name for Kitsap County, which eventually got changed, I think, in the early 1900s. So it actually, I put that it gets pretty dark after a little over a week of the story plot line. Uh, things start getting pretty dark in this uh, this particular book, which is uh, makes for a fast read. And I wrote, uh, towards the end, it reads just like a Canadian prepper deep dive analysis from his After the Collapse series. So it really gets down into some scary thoughts, scary situations that happen, and how the characters that you become invested in respond to those situations. There are several different characters that are involved in this book. Again, the main character is Phil, but a lot of the other characters have their own different subplots that are going on that take place at various locations throughout Western Washington. And eventually they all start coming together at the compound that Phil's established at a rifle range. So some of the other characters uh, I call Big Tony is one of them. Uh, another one is Dr. Stuart Schwartz in it. He's a doctor and he has his own little subplot that's going on. And there's various events that are happening, some that are happening over over at Mount Rainier, some that are happening over at Slaughter County or Kitsap County, over on the peninsula, some that are happening in downtown Seattle, and you're kind of following along those individual story arcs that happen throughout the book. As you're reading the story, the start of each chapter kind of has a little rough timeline to show you where it's at since the Tacoma's Hammer or the Mount Rainier eruption. So it'll say something like Tacoma's Hammer plus six hours. That means it's six hours after Mount Rainier erupted. And it'll keep doing that throughout the book. So it'll go Tacoma's Hammer plus two days, plus 10 days, plus 14 days. And the story kind of takes place after maybe about three weeks total. But that helps you keep track of where the character characters are in the timeline of all the events that happen in this story. So while each sub-character has their own different subplots, the majority of the story, the ones that I was most invested in, is what's happening with Phil at the rifle range, and that's become his bug out location. In addition to some of his family, friends, and other range members, they start congregating to this rifle range. In the book, it's described in great detail, this rifle range, and so I did some investigation and found out that it's a real rifle range. So I got to contact Austin Chambers and wanted to visit the rifle range, which he was kind enough to let me, and we spent some time this past summer doing uh, a tour of this uh, rifle range which is super interesting. He was able to describe where some of these events that happened in the book, how he kind of mentally saw them taking place uh, in this, the real rifle range, which is super fascinating. I have an earlier interview that I posted a few months back with Austin Chambers where we talk about that in a little bit more detail. But again, the main storyline, especially the part that I was invested in, is what's happening at that bug out location at the rifle range with Phil and his posse. Let's start off with a lot of the things that I really liked about the storyline. The first is all the prepper gear and references that are related to prepping. There's some funny little quotes that are in there. It's really cool to just kind of hear some of the gear that we talk about here online in the prepper community referenced in a book. Uh, the one that got me to chuckle the most was when they mentioned about the water bob, which I did a review of a few years back. But there's other uh, prepper references. They talk about Thrive Food. They talk about Mountain House. They talk about Silcock Keys. There's a lot of different things that are prepper related and which is really cool to see in print. Uh, the other thing that I really liked on it are the, all the tactical scenes. I think uh, the author, Austin Chambers, has a long career as an author in store for him just on the tactical scenes alone because they're in such great detail. It's, it's really fascinating and you could tell that he knows what he's talking about in those situations. So while the other storylines also are really interesting, uh, the, the tactical scenes really stand out as for his writing and description of the different events that are happening in there. Uh, next, I have I, I like all the local sp specifics. I can visualize all of the places. So he goes into great detail on certain streets and areas that are in town, whether it be in Seattle or in Kitsap County or whatever. And you could really visualize it. You could say, oh, I, I've been there. I've been on that road. And, and it's really, for me, it was really cool to read that in print. And then I really liked, uh, there's some cool tricks and things to think about as far as what the preppers are doing for uh, when they're getting gear or whether they're uh, bartering or whether they're doing some little hacks to help uh, obtain resources. For example, there's one where they have like an umbrella and they turn the umbrella in, in a five gallon bucket, open up the umbrella, cut a hole at the bottom and, and use that to collect rain water, which I thought was pretty cool. There's a lot of little cool little tricks like that that occur in this book. 
What I'd like to do now is go through a mental shopping list that I was keeping track of as I was reading the book. There were, again, there were a lot of cool prepper items that were talked about in this storyline, and I kind of took note of some of that one that were used in the book that I it helped to reinforce some of my own thoughts that I had already. A lot of this gear I already have, some of it I didn't have. So I'm just going to read what I wrote down for a shopping list based off of the book Cascadia Fallen. So uh, it's one of the characters had a personal tourniquet. It reinforced that you, it's good to have a tourniquet if you aren't your EDC if you can. Uh, uh, the doctor, Stuart Schwartz, had $600 cash on hand, so I, I think that's good to have for emergency situations. Uh, the author, uh, uh, Dave Ramsey, recommends $1,000 cash. There was a lot of uh, camping gear and get-home bag gear that was bartered throughout the, the storyline, almost like at swap meets. Uh, gorilla tape, there was a, sport, a portable spotlight that was used often. Uh, another one that was kind of unique that uh, really made me think, uh, there was uh, the need uh, for a chainsaw. So one of the characters had a chainsaw, I think multiple people had chainsaws, and they became handy because there was a lot of fallen trees and they needed to clear the roadways. And so it made me think, man, I really need to have like my my bug out or my emergency chainsaw for those types of situations. I thought that was pretty cool. Again, the water bob, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, so again, the chainsaw for clearing, uh, for need to have gas, chain oil. It was, it was basically in the grid down scenario, like the chainsaw was almost part of their EDC, which I thought was kind of unique. Uh, they had some cooking set, dehydrated food, hammock, all came into play uh, for this one. Again, I mentioned about the umbrella and the bucket for water collection. I thought that was pretty clever. Uh, they, a lot of the long-term food stores that we talk about here on on YouTube and just in general with the pre preparedness community, uh, they're talking about Thrive Food. They're talking about MREs, Mountain House. Those all were beneficial in this. Food was very valuable in addition to water because a lot of the water was contaminated due to the eruption of Mount Rainier with uh, the ash and soot and everything like that, uh, making the water dirty, basically. Uh, another cool item that was mentioned in this book was the Gotenna mesh, which I'm working on a review of. It, it was really cool. They used it in a tactical situation. I don't want to give away too many spoilers on this one, but basically the Gotenna mesh pairs with your smartphone using Bluetooth. It uses, a, it's on the 900 megahertz range, and it's basically a text and GPS locator, and you're able to communicate with people that have this even if the cell phones are down. And they use this during this tactical situation. Some of the meshes are meant to be relay nodes and other ones are on their phones but it's basically they're doing a a, a tactical situation and they're able to text each other using these gotenna meshes they all had some of them and they were able to communicate and do their strategy which was, was pretty cool in the book it was a pretty exciting scene uh, the silcott key was used during bartering a lot which was really cool uh, a lot of people were selling their water filtration straws and water bottles for a premium price, like $60, which they're really affordable now. In a grid down situation where everyone needed one, uh, the price went up for that. Uh, the goal zero was mentioned in the book. Uh, they even used a, a, a drone, so a drone for a tactical scenario that happens. Again, I'm not going to give too many spoilers on this particular one, but they were able to use this for surveillance to try to figure out where some bad people were doing something and they leveraged the drone in addition to the go tenant meshes for that particular scenario uh, which was pretty exciting it's a pretty exciting part of the book uh, fresh water again was key a lot of people were doing bartering gasoline for water where they trade a, a gallon of gasoline for a, a few uh, five gallon jugs of water because all the water was contaminated and then uh, coffee again was very valuable in this particular storyline I just want to go over a few other cool tidbits that I wrote down so there was a scene that happened over by the stadiums in downtown Seattle it, it involved someone that had some they were running out of food basically all they really had was condiments so some of the people that had experience I think there is like a homeless person had experience in making a condiment soup basically so they had condiments and broth and ketchup and they made basically their own little soup just to have some kind of a feeling of something in their stomach so I thought that was pretty uh it was a pr pretty cool scene where a, a few years ago I had a series called Learning from the Homeless and where they're kind of leveraging some of those skills that maybe some of the homeless people use. So this was something that reminded me of that. Again, the, the bartering was really interesting to see how that went on in the storyline. Again, this is a fictional story, but it was cool how they were doing various bartering for different gear and to see what gear was of more value to other than others. Uh, another note that I put in there is biscuits. I need I said make sure that I know how to make biscuits because they used a 
at the rifle range for their meals. There was a particular scene where they're making a lot of little biscuits and stew is what they were eating in a community scenario. They were having their, uh, their meal. They had basically three meals per day at the rifle range. So they had, it seemed like they had a good amount of food. The other people uh, were running out of food, but at the rifle range, they at least wanted to keep up their calorie intake because there was a lot of, uh, you know, strenuous activity that they had to do as well. There was a scary scene, uh, again, that happened in Seattle where basically they started putting RFID bracelets on people to monitor how many meals they got. And people, again, there were a lot of sheep were there basically being told what to do. And so they would have to show their RFID tag to get scanned, to get uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then eventually stuff starts running out and it starts going bad from there. But the RFID comes into play in, in the storyline. Uh, another cool tidbit I wrote is just the, the, how the Dutch oven was leveraged. I have a video that I'm going to be coming out for a Dutch oven cooking uh, later, but it was really beneficial. And again, it's an, that's a cooking item that all preppers, I think, should have. Uh, again, the soups were like a big deal. That was a lot of the meals were soup. So it, they might have had some water and just to be able to have some kind of brothy soup was used a lot for the meals in this storyline. And then I, the other cool tidbit I wrote was just on the watch rotation, uh, the, who's on guard while everyone sleeps. So they had to keep some amount of sleep going, but they needed to have someone on guard. And it was interesting seeing how they had the rotations for that. So in summary, I really, really like this book. It's a super fast read, and I became incredibly invested in the characters. And by the time I was done with the book, I was like, wait a second, it's done? What happens next? Uh, I don't want to give away too much that happens in there, but I'm going to provide information on where you could purchase this book at. You could get it from Amazon, a physical copy of the book. You could get a PDF version of it or an e-reader version for your Kindle e-reader. You could also get it on Amazon Audible and have an audiobook of it. I read a lot of it physically, but I also did a lot of it with Amazon Audible during my commute to and from work. And it's a super fast read. Once you get started, once you start figuring out who the various characters are and as time starts going beyond when Tahoma's Hammer hit, and a lot of society starts breaking down, it starts going really, really fast. And by the end of it, you're going to be wanting more. And so uh, I think I highly recommend this book. Again, it's part of a three-part series. And the second book, I believe, is coming out in a couple months from now. So I'm going to provide information for that in the description box below. I'm super excited to pick up where I left off with all of these characters that I became invested in in this book. So again, I, I highly commend author Austin Chambers for writing the story and taking the initiative to do this. Again, this is his first book and it doesn't feel like it. It feels like he's a well-established author. So I, it was great talking with him over the summer about his strategy and his process for figuring out the different plot lines and how to write a book and how to, you know, make it all cohesive and everything like that. And I think he has a long career ahead of him. So again, I'll give you all the information for where you can get the book at. There's also some swag merchandise like the shirt that you see here. Uh, eventually Phil be, starts creating, uh, there's different prepper groups that start forming. And one of them is Phil's group at the rifle range. And they start, they have like a posse basically that they, they form and they start meeting with other preparedness groups that are prepared and they start dealing with a lot of the chaos that's happening from the storyline. So so again, the story gets pretty dark. There's some stuff that happens that uh, is probably not kid friendly, uh, but it's still pretty realistic on the, some of the stuff that we've analyzed here on YouTube and the preparedness community. And Austin Chambers has written a storyline about that. So it's super fascinating. If you're a prepper, I would recommend this book. If you're if you're into earthquakes, I would recommend this book. If you're into, into Mount Rainier or Tahoma, I would also check out this book. It, it, I think a lot of people, this book will resonate with them and it's super interesting and you're going to want to keep reading. So the new book is coming out in a couple months from now. I'll put information on that in the description box below. So I'm like super excited for continuing the storyline of Phil and the other characters that are in his posse. So leave your comments below in the comment section regarding this video. I went into a lot of detail on this one, so I know it's kind of probably a little bit lengthy in duration, but I hope it was worthwhile. And again, check out this book. You're supporting a prepper. Austin Chambers is a prepper just like all of us. So if you pick up a book, you're supporting a prepper and you're helping him be able to write more and more books and storylines that are you're going to get super invested in. And it gives you a lot of cool tidbits, stuff that you might want to buy, stuff to think about, different scenarios that will make you think, well, what would I do in that situation? Or where would I, where would my bug out location be? Or what would I barter this for that for? All of those are discussed in this book and it's super interesting. So again, if you're a prepper, you're really going to like this one. So leave your comments below in the comment section. And I hope you enjoyed this book review of Cascadia Fallen to Homeless Hammer written by Austin Chambers. See you guys. Mm -hmm.